Uh, five, six, seven, eight. As the curtains lift on the stage of a chorus line, we see a horde of dancers auditioning to a bombastic jazz combination and a loud chorus of desperate inner thoughts all coming together with one shared goal, getting the job. God, I hope I get it. I hope I get it. After being put through their paces by director Zach, the group dwindles down to just 17 individuals, standing on a line, holding their resumes. As the opening number ends, we are left with a second to last dancer on the line, singing a soft inner monologue, making the explosive ending of the song quickly turn into a personal, uniquely sentimental moment. The director asks the dancers to say their names, age, and place of origin. We end with Deanna, whose tough gal act quickly gets caught off guard by him asking her, Go on, Deanna. Go on, what? The auditionees are all taken aback as they are one by one asked to elaborate on themselves, going from being completely uncomfortable to opening up bit by bit until the group becomes much more intimate, both with itself and with the audience. At the end, however, only eight of them become the dancing ensemble to Zack's show, leaving those rejected with salt thrown on their wounds as they are unceremoniously asked to leave the building after bearing their soul. Now, this scenario is not likely to ever happen, and a Chorus Line's director and choreographer Michael Bennett has explained, I have to say that the nicest thing a director can be in an audition is businesslike. Don't be friendly, don't raise false hopes. Let the rejected candidate walk out with dignity. However, this situation is much closer to reality than one might expect, and the bittersweet ending of the piece is, in a way, representative of the real-life experiences of the dancers behind a chorus line. With an upcoming Netflix series to be directed by Ryan Murphy, and a potential Broadway revival, both coming in the next five years, I'd say it's about time to look back at the process behind a chorus line, and understand how it was built upon not only Bennett's genius, but also on the stories of many Broadway dancers, who, in my opinion, do not get all the credit that they deserve. It wasn't all Michael's doing. Michael just took us and picked and got all the information, but it was us who created it, you see. But Michael controlled that. You see, a chorus line is important for many reasons, but what is perhaps the most remarkable one can be summed up by Bayork Lee, one of the original cast members. It was the first ever reality show to make it to the stage. A chorus line was a compilation of stories by dancers in a company, our struggles to make it to the stage, why we love dance, everything we gave up to work in this industry. A chorus line was created through two separate trains of thought. The first was two Broadway dancers, Michonne Peacock and Tony Stevens, who, after being part of the disastrous Rachel Lily Rosenblum and Don't You Forget It, which had closed after just seven preview performances, had the idea, whilst drinking, obviously, of creating a troupe exclusively made of Broadway dancers as a response to 70s inflation and cultural changes hitting Broadway particularly hard. Meanwhile, Michael Bennett, who had already been nominated for and awarded various Tony Awards, particularly for Sondheim's Follies, had found himself wanting to put on a show of people being honest with each other, as well as one with only Broadway dancers. We had done Coco and Promises and all these opera, big, 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 big heavily singers. produced, star-driven musicals. And Michael always wanted to do a show about dancers. Peacock and Stevens would contact Bennett about their idea. He expressed interest. And so, at midnight January 26th, 1974, at the Nikolaus Exercise Center in New York, 18 to 30 dancers would come together and just... talk. Michael didn't know what he wanted, he, if he, this was going to be a play, a musical, or a book, or a movie. He just got a group of people together and they were going to talk about the situation of Broadway and dancers because we thought dancers were dying. The first recorded line on the tapes was Bennett. I really want to talk about us, where we came from, why we're dancers, what the alternatives are, why we think we're in this business. 
Starting with hesitant and somewhat awkward introductions, the talking, as led by Bennett, who would always answer his questions first with surprising honesty, quickly drifted into deep topics, including childhood, worries, passions, and more. Of course, this was fueled by the food and quote-unquote cheap red wine that Bennett had provided. Not only that, but he also brought along people who already had rivalries amongst each other to help fuel the fire, so to say. We went from like 12 o'clock to, I don't know, 7 in the morning, 8 in the morning. We were drinking, smoking, doing a lot of different things. And uh, we had started we had started out with a sandwich. And then all of a sudden, you got very comfortable just talking to these other people. It was really, it was group therapy. It would last 12 hours, and soon a second session would occur, leaving Bennett with a total of 30 hours of recorded tapes. Eventually, the idea of a basic plot came to him. Then I realized that what those kids had been doing was auditioning their lives for me. Recognizing the golden potential of the idea, Bennett then showed the tapes to Joseph Papp, owner of the Public Theater, who less than one hour into them would agree to give him the space to use for workshopping the project. Soon enough, the project would gain the rest of its creators, including composer Marvin Hamlish, lyricist Edward Kleban, choreographer Bob Avian, and playwright Nicolas Dante. Considering the show was actually based on real life stories, you'd think that the dancers behind them would be a good option for playing these characters on stage, but not quite. In fact, the interviewed dancers were surprised to find themselves having to audition for roles that were telling their own stories. You know, it was never about how well you danced or how well you looked. It was what your being was about, it was what your personality was about, it was what your presence was about, what you could bring to the stage. Amongst the dancers that did not make the show were Steve Bookvor and Denise Pence, a couple who had attended the group interviews and detailed how it feels when one of them got into a show and the other didn't, would be used as inspiration for Al and Christine, who, in an initial version of the script, would experience this exact thing, with Christine making it through and Al getting rejected. In the final version, however, both Al and Christine, much like their real-life counterparts, don't get cast in the show itself. Similarly, the character of quirky Texan Judy Turner was based on the life story of Jackie Garland, but the role would end up being taken by Patricia Garland, her sister, who she attended the taping sessions with. My sister's here, and she was one of the ones that auditioned at that same time, and I did her monologue. Little brat, that's what my sister was, a little brat. Even Michonne Peacock was not cast in the show as the character representing her story, BB, and the woman who did, Jan Robertson, would leave the show in its workshop stages in order to participate in A Matter of Time, a show that ran for all of one performance. And so the mantle would be taken up by Nancy Lane instead, who auditioned with the mindset that she kinda looked like Peacock, which, yeah, fair enough. Even among the dancers that were cast, many of them would not be playing themselves. For example, Donna McKechnie, who would play Cassie, Zack's ex-wife, had her story spread amongst various characters, providing some of her family issues to the various stories in the iconic At The Ballet number, whilst her own character was the most fictional one of the entire cast. Even playwright Nicholas Dante's story would become part of the show, being used as Paul's monologue about his experiences with sexuality and his femininity. He had a way of putting the words together from his heart, you know. So, but that night, I mean, it was like, all right, that was quite, that was amazing. I mean, I mean, it's practically verbatim. However, the very thing that made the character's stories and chorus lines so genuine was also one of the musical's biggest issues. As Bennett's lawyer, John Brelio, told him, You can't have these people sitting around telling you their life stories for a show. You're going to have 20 authors and 20 lawsuits. You've got to get them to sign a release. And so, in the break of the first workshop for the show, the dancers sold their life stories for... Drum roll, please. A single dollar each with the agreement that their names would be changed if the stories made it onto the show. Right. We did sign away our lives for a dollar. All the rights, all the logo things, all everything that you see our picture on, we get popped in. Even those not involved in the process beyond the interviews were contacted, and in the end, all of them signed away their stories. Some, including Priscilla Lopez, who would originate the role of Diana, could tell they were making a mistake by doing so, and 
depending on how you see it, they might have been right in thinking that. But you have no you know, idea it's going to be. No, what it I becomes. mean, and neither did Michael, and it was everyone's risk. And and okay, it was a ten-minute break, and we didn't have a lawyer. Okay, but um, <laughs> but when Michael Bennett is writing a show for you, yeah. In, in my case, you know, I, I knew Michael for many years as friends, as co-workers, and and uh, you know, I was I said, where do I sign? Tony Stevens would speculate that their eagerness to take the deal perhaps came from the dancer mentality of not asking questions, but it's just as likely that they were scared of what would happen if they didn't agree to it, or that they just wanted to appease the at the time very popular Mr. Bennett. Even with that out of the way, the show was only in its beginning phase. With all the stories that it wanted to tell, the first workshop presented a version that was five hours long, only having one song, which ended up cut, in 17 monologues. It played like Gone with the Wind on a bad day. Everybody had a crisis, everybody was crying, and we looked at each other and said, oi, this is awful. And uh, it was. It was apparently so bad that three actors left slash were fired from the show at that point, including Barry Bostwick, originally cast as Zack, a role that was later taken up by Robert Lapone, Patty Lapone's brother, who had originally been cast as Al instead. My, my, my recollection is that Barry was unhappy, I think, with how the part was developing or something like that, or that Michael and he didn't get along. I don't know the specifics. All I saw was Barry's back walking out. Clearly, work had to be done, which is why James Kirkwood Jr. was brought into the team as a co-writer. Throughout the second workshop and all throughout the rehearsal process, much of the show would still change as a result of the cast itself, though obviously not without Bennett's influence on them. The atmosphere of the rehearsals was also supposedly engineered by Bennett to be competitive, ensuring that the show itself would really have that audition type of vibe. As Sammy Williams, who played Paul in the original production, describes the experience, the process of putting together a chorus line was like a therapy session. Every day, we would go in and be analyzed, directed, manipulated, and choreographed. We were puppets, and Michael was the puppeteer. I felt like literally every night we were auditioning for our jobs, and it was a necessary element in the show to make it as successful as it was. Yes, it was painful, but there, for, I always felt, did you not, that there was always the element that, gee, if you didn't do what you wanted or Mr. Bennett wanted you to do, there was always a possibility that you would be in the wings and somebody else would be there. For example, in the second workshop, Bennett, during a dance combination, fell to the ground, clutching his knee in pain. The dancers scrambled, all reacting differently to this, some panicking, some trying to help, only for Bennett to reveal that he had faked the whole injury in order to get everyone's reactions. He would use said reactions in what would become the alternative scene, where Paul damages his knee, and the characters are forced to face the realities of their career choice. Another example of this was Richie's character. Originally meant to be a female part, the role in its story belonged to Candy Brown and even had its own solo developed, which, side note, is actually such a good song and it's such a shame it got cut. My daddy gave presents a girl couldn't read a few. But Candy would eventually leave the production in order to be part of Chicago. Ronald Dennis would then be brought in to replace her in the second workshop, and Shoes was cut, being instead replaced by Confidence, a duet between Richie and Connie about the difficulties of being a non-white performer in auditions. It was about <coughs> whether me being black and Bayer being Chinese, which right. one better for the job? Which was removed for being too musical comedy. Hmm. Seeing every other dancer get their own solo and time in the limelight during the rehearsal period would infuriate Dennis. This would last until two weeks before the show's opening. At this time, Bennett gave Dennis a rough draft of a song and told him to work on it. And so, the number would eventually become the super energetic Give Me the Ball segment. Dennis would recount the story in 2017, adding that now he believes Bennett knew exactly what he was doing in fueling his passion by making him feel pushed aside, but that he still regrets signing away the royalty rights for helping make the track. Though some of Bennett's methods might have been, uh, a bit questionable. Michael came up to me before, the sh before, just before he walked on stage and he says, I want real tears tonight, and I said to him, Michael, how do I do that? And he said to me, just think about how much I hate you and turned around and walked away, and I was totally devastated. But he pushed the right button. By, by the time I got to my monologue, I was just a basket case. I was a mess. 
It's quite clear from various interviews with the dancers that Bennett truly understood how to push people to where they needed to be. He really knew how to, to um, get the best out of you. By the time of the show's off-Broadway stage, only a few of the dancers from the original taped sessions would remain. For the main cast, there was Donna McKechnie as Cassie, Renee Bauman as Christine, Wayne Salento as Mike, Patricia Garland as Judy, Kelly Bishop as Sheila, Priscilla Lopez as Deanna, Thomas Walsh as Bobby, and Sammy Williams as Paul, as well as Pam Blair as Val, and Bayark Lee as Connie, who were in a personal session with Bennett rather than one of the group ones. Of course, then there was also the rest of the cast, including the other seven main auditionees, ten early rejectees that would also function as the show swings and understudies, Zach the director, and his assistant Larry. That's a full cast. <laughs> yeah, sure, not everyone was telling their own story, but Real stories were going to be told nonetheless. So, was all the effort worth it? The cast and crew were initially very nervous that it was too uniquely about the industry and that audiences wouldn't really appreciate it. But fortunately for them, these worries proved to be unfounded. The show would open off-Broadway in the Public Theater in April 1975, and it was an absolute success. Joseph Papp moved the production to the Broadway stage, specifically the Schubert Theater, just three months later, and the show was hugely successful there as well. Remember how the 70s had been a really hard moment for dancers on Broadway? Well, a chorus line may or may not have saved the industry at that time, bringing Broadway's attendance from 6.6 .6 million in 1974 to 7.2 million in 1975. All a chorus line has done is win nine Tony Awards, five Drama Desk Awards, the Pulitzer Prize, an Obie, a Drama Critics Award, a London Evening Standard Award. It has won a special Tony in 1984 when it became... In 1984, it became the longest running show on Broadway. Until it was taken over by Cats, that is. So, it was definitely a financial and critical success, and fortunately for the dancers, the show's success trickled down into their $1 deal with Bennett as well. He and his lawyers, including the previously mentioned John Brelio, would create an arrangement where the 37 actors involved at any point in the creation of the show were divided into three groups and compensated accordingly. There was Group A, who had participated in the original taped sessions and or had participated in both workshops, Group B, who had only been in the taped sessions, and Group C, who had not participated in the early parts of the show at all with some dancers supposedly recalling a promise that Group A and B would also receive income from any future production of A Chorus Line. We'll get back to that part later. This deal meant that Bennett would be giving away about a third of his income from the show, which was not all that bad considering he was earning millions, and so some of the dancers involved would be earning as much as $10,000 a year at the show's peak popularity. For some, like Steve Bookvor, who actually did eventually play the role of Zack, the deal was considered a blessing. He would praise the man, explaining that although he somewhat manipulated the dancers and their stories, he also undoubtedly created a masterpiece, one that would be considered one of Broadway's greatest, especially at the time. On April 18, 1990, the show shut down after a whopping 6,137 performances, and the cast members would go their own ways through life. Sammy Williams, after winning a Tony for his portrayal of Paul, would leave acting to study floristry for 10 years. Patricia Garland would have to stop professionally dancing after a ligament rupture on her knee. Kelly Bishop would play a main role in Gilmore Girls for several years. Wayne Salento would become a prolific Broadway choreographer. And Bennett's last major project was co-directing the original Broadway production of Dreamgirls in 1981. In 1987, he would unfortunately pass away from AIDS-related lymphoma at age 44, with the tapes being passed down to Bob Avian, a Chorus Lines co-choreographer, and John Brelio. The story of a Chorus Lines dancers and their relationship with the show wouldn't end there, however. In 2006, the show would be revived for Broadway, now being directed by Avian and produced by Brelio, with the original choreography reconstructed by Bayark Lee. Whilst this production didn't do quite as well as the original, lasting only two years and not winning any major awards, 
it was still quite praised and helped keep the show alive on stage and on the audience's minds. However, it also brought up some bittersweet feelings from its original cast. As it turns out, the agreement that had been signed in 1974 did not include any royalties from future first class productions, meaning the dancers would get no financial benefit from major market tours or Broadway revivals. I mean, no one, I don't remember anyone of us going to him and saying, don't you think we are owed? Nobody did, and he was, you know, initiated well, that. So all these years later, of, of course you can go back and go, what gee, I we, thinking, what yeah. were we, but I, you know, along the way. I mean, that's our business, isn't it? This would leave the original dancers in a hard position. At one point, when we were young and stupid, we kind of signed our lives away, and they exploited that. We were the authors of the show, and we should have been paid accordingly. Kelly Bishop would add that, while there obviously would have never been a chorus line without Bennett, the show also would never have happened without the dancers either. Not only that, but also in 2006, they were requested to give permission for their real names to be used for any future project that involved release of the original tapes. In the end, only three of them agreed, including Book 4 and Pence, while the rest held off on accepting this. It would take 16 months of deciding on the exact intentions behind Bennett's old contract for the dancers that helped build a chorus line and the beneficiaries of Bennett's estate to come to a conclusion. Finally, the artists whose life stories the show was based off of, including Michonne Peacock and Tony Stevens, the two whose idea back in the early 70s would snowball into one singular sensation, a share in both the revival and any future first-class productions of the piece. Though using real people's stories in the piece created, well, a lot of issues for all parties involved, most everyone in the original production still holds much love for the show. Priscilla Lopez, for example, has explained how much she loved the experience of a chorus line and wouldn't trade any of it, but the problems surrounding the dancers not getting their due for so long made part of her feel weary about it. Ultimately, it would seem that not only did the characters mirror real life, but the play itself does too. There's the obvious parallel of how the auditionees open up to Zack the same way that these dancers had opened up to Bennett, with some getting cast and others not, but then there's also the finale, one reprise. In it, the characters we have spent the last hour and a half getting to love put on the same glittery gold clothes and suddenly we as the audience can't tell them apart anymore. Their individual stories in the grand scheme of things no longer matter. Perhaps we can consider this bizarre feeling as representative of how the original dancers lost their stories and these have just become one part of the script, with a lot of people not even knowing the full story behind the show. Now, maybe we can look at what I did for love as a mirror to the real life feelings of the cast towards the production. Clearly, the history that we have and the experience that we had doing this show will never compare to me or any other company. You just wanted to be the best you could for him. And, you know, I'm very aware, you know, everyone says manipulation, and that's all true, but I didn't mind that. New York and I were Tommy's caregivers for his last year. Uh. And we were with him every day, and he loved Chorus Line and everything. <laughs> I just want to say thank you to Michael Bennett for giving us the greatest gift, the gift that keeps giving. Or maybe that's a bit too pretentious of me to say, I don't know. But I also don't think it's entirely fair to completely criticize Bennett. Sure, some of his actions weren't ideal, but he did build one of the most influential pieces of musical theater of all time by mortalizing these stories, and at the end of the day, it's as Bennett himself said, there's truth on that stage. Nothing monumental or astounding, but truth nonetheless. Not only will a chorus line's legacy and that of its dancers live on, but as of 2016, John Braulio has plans of bringing the show back for yet another revival in 2025 in order to match with the original's 50th anniversary, though he wasn't sure of whether it'd be the same show or potentially a new version of it, addressing more contemporary issues that dancers face. If the latter happens to be the case, well, I can only hope that it will maintain that same magic and ingenuity as the original. No matter what form the show comes back in, one thing is for sure. 
it isn't the end. I mean, Chorus Line right. does very well, and I think Chorus Line is going to be around on Broadway for a few more years, and I certainly think that, you know, it will be around for a long, long time. Hi, I'm the person that did that whole video just now. I know I'm not the usual person who posts on this channel, that's my boyfriend. I've been working behind the scenes this entire time, but I figured, you know, this is a topic that I'm personally so invested in that I figured I should do a video about it myself. This is a topic that I've been very passionate about for years. Uh, Chorus Line has been my favorite musical for at least two, three years. And um, just recently, this year, before everything went to shit, <laughs> I was actually in a production of it where I played Paul. It was great. Ah, oh, such a good role. My God, so long, that monologue. I hope that this topic was as interesting to whoever made it this far as it is to me. I have a lot of love for everyone involved in the project, from the cast, the crew, even Michael Bennett, you know? Like I said, you can judge him for some bits a little bit, but at the end of the day, it's an amazing product that came out of it and something that I personally connect with. Anyway, I hope that you guys have enjoyed this absolute beast. And um, like, subscribe, and I'll see you later.